as they say in basketball, substitution. Donna Adelson has new counsel, and we're learning a few things from the application for a search warrant and, indeed, the affidavit that is attached to the application for a search warrant that may give us some insights into where the case is going for the state. So, without further ado, let's jump right into that. This is the motion for substitution of counsel that has been filed by Daniel Rashbaum. And it's not exactly rocket science here. He says, you know, Marissa DeCalzo, Esquire, filed her notice of appearance for defendant on November 14th. On January 4, the defendant retained Daniel Rashbaum, Esquire, and Robert Morris, Esquire, to represent her in the above cause. The defendant joins in the filing of this motion. So it is respectfully requested that this court order enter an order allowing Daniel Rashbaum and Robert Morris to be substituted as counsel for defendant in the above styled cause. Now, Donna Adelson has signed off on this, as you can see, as has Rashbaum and Morris, but there is a name missing, and that is the Marissa DeCalzo Esquire. So when you file a motion to substitute, normally what that means is that you are replacing a lawyer who is planning on withdrawing. Uh, she may not necessarily be planning on withdrawing. She may have been fired by Donna after that awful uh, hearing that they had where she clearly didn't know how to get hold of her client. This is a problem when you are operating outside your jurisdiction. Now, I've had numerous opportunities to operate outside my jurisdiction. I've handled False Claims Act cases in, Cal in California and in Texas and in Florida, a number of other places. And whenever you go in, you always hire local counsel. Now, you don't expect them to do a whole lot in the case. They are basically there to keep you from falling flat on your face by not understanding a local rule or a local custom. Sometimes local customs are more important than local rules. I'll give you a good example. In St. Louis, if you go in with a motion for summary judgment, which usually is a fairly long, lengthy motion, and it has lots of evidence associated with it, deposition transcripts, and all kinds of things like that. It can be enough to fill a three-ring binder that's, you know, three inches thick. And if you go into St. Louis Circuit Court, and you file that, and then you go to the hearing, and you haven't provided a notebook for the judge prior to the hearing so that he can follow along and have the indexed, have the exhibits all indexed so that he can turn back and forth between them, you're going to find uh, that you get a much colder reception than if you've taken good care of the judge to make his job easier. Now, that's a local custom. There's nothing in the local rules that would inform you of that, but any lawyer who has practiced in the city of St. Louis would know that cold. There are a lot of little things like that in the law that don't get published and don't get circulated around, but... Everybody knows that it's a good idea to have local counsel. And it's also a really good idea to converse with them when you have an issue that you need to deal with in a, in a particular case. And I believe that if she had had local counsel, she could have figured out how to get in touch with her client, and it might not have made such a big mess of things, which might indicate to me why Donna Adelson has perhaps terminated her. So now let's take a look at the search warrant application and the affidavit that accompanies the search warrant application because I think it gives us some insight into perhaps where the state is going, what kind of evidence they are looking for uh, to connect up all of the dots in the Adelson murder plot uh, or Markle uh, murder plot, whichever of those two you think might apply here. Clearly, the Adelsons are involved in some way. Charlie Adelson's already been convicted, and the victim was Dan Markle. So here is the uh, affidavit, and well, the application and the affidavit that accompanies it. 
Legal grounds pursuant to uh, Florida Statute 933.02, the property constitutes element relevant to proving that a felony has been committed. And they're looking at the laptop, uh, the MacBook Pro, of one of the Adelsons. I believe this is Harvey Adelson's laptop. So what they're looking for, digital information including but not limited to subscriber identity modules, mass media, text and multimedia messages for SMS or multimedia uh, message services. Those are the kind of message services like iMessage where you can get both a uh, you know, a, a document or, or words, but in addition you can, you can get a picture. Mobile chat messages, iMessages, third-party communication application messages like Facebook um, Messenger, that sort of thing. Twitter, Twitter has private messages. Uh, all of these things, emails, contact, phone information, passwords, stored location data. That's That I think will be important. Audio files, including voicemails, either audio or transcribed. Now, normally you wouldn't find that on an iPad. I mean, I'm sorry. Normally you wouldn't find that on a MacBook Pro. My MacBook Pros do not obtain information from my phone that are voicemails unless you go to the trouble of saving them. And, of course, if your voicemail in some way implicated you in a crime, I doubt very seriously if you would go to a lot of trouble to save it. But be that as it may, that's what is being asserted here as the rationale. Now, probable cause. The facts and information obtained by your affiant, that's the investigator here, with regard to this matter comprise proof to establish probable cause respectfully submitted as follows. So, this is the, it's related to the murder of Professor Markle. And he had his, and the murder was on July 18th, 2014. And then it goes through a fairly uh, comprehensive recitation of the facts about how the investigation went on. During the on scene investigation of the reported incident, it was determined that Markle was the divorced, divorced father of two children. Children were not present. Markle's ex-wife was identified as Wendy Adelson. Adelson was located at a local restaurant and contacted by investigators. She was escorted and in, uh, to TPD and informed of the situation. She was cooperative during her interview and confirmed Markle was her ex-husband with whom she shared custody of the children. During her interview, Adelson made statements that suggested the death of Markle could have been arranged by a friend or family member on her behalf without her knowledge. Adelson furthered in her suggestion that someone could have arranged the murder to help her and included a statement advising her brother, Charlie Adelson, had mentioned hiring a hitman. So we, we know all that from the trial. Um, interviews with other associates of Markle and Adelson, as well as persons knowledgeable in the divorce rulings, and it went on through how they built the case. Adelson's parents, Donna and Harvey Adelson, made contact with an investigator at, uh, right before the funeral. They said they'd go talk to him, and then they ran out down to uh, Coral Springs, where they live, and Wendy went with them. Over the next year, investigating efforts developed intelligence that indicated two persons of interest traveled from South Florida to Tallahassee on July 16th and returned on July 18th after the murder. And so it goes through the two hit people and Magbona, Magbanua, I can never say that name. Magbanua, and it says when Magbanua had frequent phone contact with Charlie Adelson, Wendy's brother, as well as at least one phone contact with Wendy's father, Harvey Adelson. In addition, available records show that persons who traveled to Tallahassee had at least one phone contact with Harvey Adelson. Now, one of the things that's really interesting to me in this affidavit is other than that brief mention of Wendy Adelson cooperating in an interview, there is not much in this affidavit that links her in any way to the crime other than what I've just gone through there. Uh, <clears throat> you can find this online uh, through the Leon County Court Records search if you want to go through it. Uh, if you think I have misstated that, I don't believe that I have, but feel free to double-check me on that. So, on April 19, 2016, investigators conducted an undercover operation which had an undercutter officer make contact 
with Donna outside the school her grandchildren attended. A flurry of phone calls occurred over the next several hours to include include calls between Donna, Charles, Catherine Magbanua. Private meetings were scheduled by Donna with Charles and by Charles with Catherine. So there we seem to have a chain that ties Donna to the woman who arranged the hit. And then it talks about the convictions of Garcia and Magbanua. And an October 2023 trial for Adelson commenced, and he was ultimately convicted. They talk about the jail calls after Charlie Adelson's guilty verdict, including multiple calls to Donna. And they even list her phone number, which is kind of funny. So they tell all of this about Charlie Adelson, that she's getting things in order, creating trust, making sure her grandchildren are taken care of. Um, they booked this flight. They didn't get on the flight because she was nabbed at the airport as she entered the jetway for her flight. As Special Agent Pat Sanford attempted to seize her cell phone, Donna attempted to pull away and prevent him from grabbing it. Donna said she was told not to give her phone to law enforcement. So they executed a search warrant. They got the phones. They got the MacBooks. And this search warrant is for a MacBook Pro seized from Harvey Adelson, on 11 14 23 and they give the serial number at this time the state would be seeking search warrant for the above listed computer for any applications or evidence of moving money assessing financial accounts or scheduling and booking travel plans to evade apprehension now why is that important here's why that's important because it shows knowledge of guilt flight shows knowledge of guilt or consciousness of guilt and it is often asserted to be that. I doubt very seriously if you would consider Vietnam to be one of the choice vacation spots in the Far East. It's hot, it's miserable, it's a jungle, there's not a lot there, and there really just isn't a whole lot that would recommend going there on vacation. So it's difficult to suggest that that might be the reason why they're going. But again, if you gather this information, you can establish that they, for example, transferred money there, that they took out large amounts of money that they were planning to take with them, that they bought readily fungible things like a couple of Rolex watches. It's well known in the special operations community that if you have a Rolex watch, you can sell it pretty much anywhere and recover at least 80 to 90 percent of the value of that watch in pretty much anywhere. So, there are lots of different reasons that they are looking at all of this information. And of course, that's what the purpose of a search warrant is, is to gather all of this evidence to be used in the prosecution. So our, over multiple search warrant devices to electronic devices to an... Well, strike this. I'll just summarize this. Basically, what he says is, I've looked at a lot of these devices over the years, and investigations of violent criminal acts lead this affiant to suspect consistently that the suspects search the internet for information related to the crimes they've committed and conduct these searches more frequently than those uninvolved. They also fixate on one event of which they are involved as opposed to other acts of a similar nature during the same time. So, for example, it would be a, a clue that Donna Adelson followed Char Charlie's trial much more closely than she followed, for example, the trial of maybe Gwyneth Paltrow or somebody like that. Electronic devices continually store data, including user and subscriber information, calendar entries, contacts, cell details, text message logs, and location information. And then it says, content for messages sent and received by email and mobile application, pictures, that sort of thing. Well, the location information is interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, if you take your laptop out of the house and you go, like sometimes I do, to Panera Bread, and you sit down and you work from Panera Bread for a little while and you're typing on the computer, it registers that MAC address of the Wi-Fi at Panera Bread. And that is stored somewhere on the computer. It's a very small amount of data, but if you know where to look for it, it'll have the date and time when you were at that particular location. And it's not hard for law enforcement to figure out where that is. I would also point out that when you are using your iPhone and you are 
using the GPS function or the Maps function. One of the ways when the iPhone can't see a GPS satellite that it figures out where you are is by looking at local Wi-Fi. They are basically stationary locations where a Wi-Fi signal emits from and is received by or out of the computer. So all of these things can help pinpoint what somebody's location was at a specific time. And that is another reason why they might want this information. There is likely information stored on electronic devices which can assist law enforcement in identifying the users of the devices. Information about the whereabouts, activities, thoughts, encounters, experiences, all of that come up. And, for example, when you take a photo with your iPhone, as I did here at Disney World in October of 2018, of this lovely piece of uh, whatever it is uh, that is uh, on the screen there. I know it was a meal that we had somewhere. I just don't remember what it is. Why do you take pictures of stuff you'll never remember what they are? I don't know, but we thought it was a good meal, so I guess that's why we took that. Maybe it was just an expensive meal, and maybe that's why we took it. But at any rate, you can see here that it shows right on the uh, thing there, that big red pen that says Bay Lake. Well, if you were to click on that part of the info tab on photos, you could expand that out to see pretty much exactly where it was taken at uh, Disney World. So that's why these things are of such value. And then they go through the rest of this and basically say what they're looking for is uh, unless disabled when pictures, videos, audio recordings are captured, electronic devices typically collect metadata for the media, including information such as date, time, and location, which is what I just went over. So at the end it says, I'm now requesting a search warrant. The data sought is any that would further the investigation into the communications and actions of Donna Adelson during the crime and any events related to this incident before the crime occurred. The data may also serve to identify those subjects who carried out the act with him and the location of any outstanding evidence. Data on the phone may include photos, videos, or internet searches. And this is a guy who's worked in the state of Florida as a sworn officer for 21 years, and he served as an investigator with the state's attorney for the past 14 years. So it's pretty obvious that they are looking for information that they can use to tie Donna to Charlie, Charlie to Magbanua, Magbanua to the killers, and thereby link Donna into the conspiracy. Obviously, they haven't finished going through those computers. They haven't gone through the text messages. They haven't gone through any of, probably haven't gone through any of the voicemails. And if they have, they're keeping that information sort of close held. Now, they do have to turn over anything that is exculpatory. For example, Donna's memo to the record that, hey, I had absolutely nothing to do with what happened to poor Dan. Gosh, I hope that his parents do well, and I hope that they learn, and, you know, I hope they, they learn who gets the, the guy who killed him. I'm sure glad that Charlie wasn't involved, you know. Things like that they have to turn over. I'm not saying that there's a document that says that, I'm just saying that sometimes stupid people do stupid things, like writing things that are essentially uh, self-serving, shall we say. So that's what they're doing. It's obvious that the investigation is still going on. I have wondered in many respects why Donna Adelson's attorneys have not invoked a speedy trial right. And one of the reasons that I'm sort of interested in why they haven't done that is because clearly if the investigation is still ongoing, there could be some advantage to getting to trial quickly before other evidence could be uncovered, that sort of thing. So we'll see how that works out. That's what I have for you today. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave them in the comments down below. Oh, thank you. I'd like to hit my microphone. You can leave them in the comments down below, or you can email me at the email address above. Today, if you have the opportunity, take a moment. Do something nice for somebody. Buy a children's book and drop it off at the hospital for the pediatric patients. Uh, buy a stuffed animal. Drop it off at the hospital for the pediatric patients. There are all kinds of things that you can do 
that will make somebody else's life better. And particularly those of us who were at one time involved in healthcare, we understand that there are a lot of reasons to be scared in a hospital, particularly if you're a child, and anything that can ameliorate that in any way is a welcome addition to the pediatric department. That's the advertisement. So, thanks again for watching, and catch me down here at the beach again next time. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.